want to welcome you all to the to the Metro Chiropractic. And for some of us, we've been around for quite a long time. And actually, Larry, Nick, uh, I think we're the three of the founding fathers that we're here right now. This has been 25 years this year that we started this. So uh, we've been together for 25 years. Uh, it's amazing. We're all only, you know, 26, 30 years old. You know, it's amazing that we started this when we were kids. So it's been a great group. It's been a great, great group of guys and, and officers to be associated with, and it's helped all of us in the uh, to grow and to and to be able to help many, many people over the course of the last 25 years. If you really think about it, we're getting into the hundreds of thousands of of lives that we've been able to touch and to help. Today's first speaker is a very good friend of ours, Dr. Mike Mills. Mike's been in practice for nine years now, practices up in, in Catanic. Dr. Mills. Good morning. <laughs> Gary's introduction helps out a little bit because usually when I'm with these guys, they're really surprised that someone this young would be part of the group. You know, uh, we, we had our Christmas party and, and John Gump was there, and so he, since he's not here, we're going to talk about him. And, uh, Rom was there, and Rom had his date with him for the night, and he was introducing everybody, and I said, and they introduced John Gump, and I said, I'm his grandson, and uh, she didn't know any difference, so John didn't think it was really funny, but it was nice, so, yeah, I've been in practice in Catanning for nine years, um, you know, every one of us has a different style of practice, maybe a different philosophy of practice, different techniques that we use on patients, but really what draws us together is our philosophy, and, and that's what I want to try to give us today, is a little bit of philosophy about chiropractic and a why behind what we do and uh, why that's important and, and how our chiropractic philosophy brings us together. Because, you know, every one of us come to work every day, doctors, staff, to try to help as many people as we possibly can. So what I want to do kind of to get us started, to help set the stage of why it's so important that we do what we do every day, I'm going to go through some statistics with you. And uh, these are motivating to me. I think you'll find them very motivating to yourself. But um, this is something that was put out by the World Health Organization. And what the health, World Health Organization has 191 countries in it. And they study different things. They study um, how effective healthcare systems are. They, they study how effective individual nations are as far as health, how healthy they really are. And out of 191 countries in the World Health Organization, who do you think spends more money on healthcare than any country in the world? The United States, right? We spend millions of more dollars every day, literally, on healthcare than any country in the world. However, our healthcare system ranks 37th. So really, there's 36 other healthcare systems that, according to their statistics, are more effective at providing health care for their individuals or for their population. As far as health is concerned, our health as a nation ranks 72nd. So literally, there's 71 other countries in the world that have a better life expectancy, have a better health than people in America, which is usually goes against what we be, you know, we've been taught. We, we kind of think we have the best healthcare system in the world, and we're the healthiest people in the world. And, uh, but the, the way I kind of think of it is, could you name 71 other countries, really? You know, if I had to stand here and just name 71 other countries, I couldn't even do it. So that means countries that you've never heard of, never been to, never even thought of, literally the people there have better qualities of life, less chronic disease, better fertility rates, things like that. So let me give you some statistics. This is from the February 17th Journal of the American Medical Association. One in two children in America have a chronic health condition lasting at least 12 months. Think about that. In America right now, one in two children have a chronic, chronic health condition lasting more than 12 months. Right now, depending on the statistics of what you read, you can read it anywhere between 40 to 60 percent of our children are obese in America, right? If you're obese by the time you're 18, you're twice as likely to die by the time you're 55. So if you're obese, by the time you're 18 years old, you're twice as likely to die by the time you're 55. Literally, if you're obese by the t in your teenage years, you literally, your, your heart, cardiovascular system functions as if you've had one heart attack. That's literally the damage that's being done. In, in uh, 1985, there were 500,000 cases of attention deficit disorder. Today, there's somewhere between 7 to 10 million cases of attention deficit disorder. There are now one in 100, every, out of 150 live births in America, one child will be autistic. Of boys born in America, one of 90 boys will be autistic. Ati autism has increased in the 90s, 70, I'm sorry, asthma has increased in the 90s 
there's been a 75% increase in asthma in the 1990s. The average American will get 11.5 prescriptions per year. We now spend $291.5 billion annually on prescription drugs alone. No surgeries, no nothing. $291 billion annually in America for prescription drugs alone. Direct to consumer marketing, right? So we're not talking about marketing to doctors or to hospitals or anything like that. Direct to consumer marketing for antidepressant drugs alone, only antidepressants is $122 million a year. That's what we're competing with in our chiropractic offices every single day. They just did a release of a study. They said, are we healthier? Over the last 10 years, the health of America has declined, not increased. Prescription drug abuse is at an all-time high. If you're a woman between 45 and 64, you will be shocked to hear this stat. Between 1990 and 2005, the rate of poisoning deaths uh, doses raised 230%. So if you're a woman between 45 and 64, the number of poisoning deaths increased 230% from what? Prescription drugs. One prescription drug was just removed from the market, Ativan. It's a diabetes drug, right? This drug caused 500 heart attacks and 300 cases of heart failure per month. Per month. So why am I standing up here telling you all this information? Because the reality is, the current healthcare system that is in place, th that's not progress, right? If asthma increased by 75%, are we getting better or worse? If attention deficit is increased from 500,000 cases to 7 to 10 million cases, is it getting better or worse? If we have one in 90 boys now being born with autism, is that getting better or worse? Worse. You know that my children, my children are the first generation in the history of America to be predicted to not outlive me and my wife, life expectancy wise. We are now raising the first generation of children in America that are predicted to not live as long as their parents did. So why are we here today? Because that's not acceptable. We live in the richest, most affluent country in the world and that's just not acceptable. My question to you is, if we don't do something about it as chiropractors, who's going to address it? Who do you refer these people to other than the current system that's in place to help these children? Right? We, we, we have to step up. You have to have a big office. I have to have a big office. We have to help hundreds of people. Why? Because lives are depending on it. One in two children in America have a chronic health disease lasting greater than 12 months. It's just not acceptable. So who's going to stand up and defend them? I mean, let's face it. We have a system that's exhausting our economy, isn't it? We spend $291 million just on prescription drugs alone, right? Listen, we spend $38 million a day on just the fractures associated with just hip fractures. Just hip fractures, just the surgeries associated with that. Not treating it, just the surgeries cost us $38 million a day. What could you do with $38 million a day to make America healthier? How many chiropractic adjustments would that give? How much education would those patients get about health and nutrition and exercise and wellness and subluxation? How much education would they get? How much of this could we prevent? You know, we're to the point where the insurance is exhausted, the person has taken a second mortgage on the house, it's exhausted, now everybody's walking around some sports field somewhere raising money so we can have more money to dump into a system that is doing what? We have a cancer rate of one in two people now. One in two Americans are going to get cancer. So look around this room. This half of the room is going to end up with cancer. Statistically, according to American statistics, right? So is spending more money fixing the problem? Do we have better drugs today than we did 50 years ago? Do we have better surgeries today than we did 50 years ago? Do you know we have more hospital beds per person in America now than at any point in the history of our country? We have more nurses per person than at any point in the history of our country. You have access to medications. People are taking more prescriptions per day now than any other time in our country. Americans get more surgeries per year than any other time in our country. What I'm saying is what we're doing is not working. It's just not working. If it was working, every, all those things would be declining, not increasing, correct? So who is going to solve the problem if we don't step up and be that person? So how do we step up and do that? Well, you know, the simplest way is just to simply do the procedures that are set in our offices in front of us every day. Do the fundamentals right every day. Educate patients about what we do. Because the reality is behavioral modification doesn't work. We've been trying to tell people, don't do this and do this for too long. 
right? If I tell you, eat broccoli, and you say, I hate broccoli. Eat broccoli, I hate broccoli. Eat broccoli, I hate broccoli. How long is that going to last? Until it goes, <laughs> right? What we have to do is change people's beliefs about health. Change what they think about health. Change their understanding, their paradigm. That's what we're going to talk about today. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. You know, that's my greatest concern for chiropractic. My greatest concern is that we become silent about the things that matter. You know why? Because there's a lot of ways to be successful in chiropractic. Without changing people's paradigms, without changing, teaching people what health is, without teaching people what subluxation is, you can become very successful in chiropractic. But what does that do to change the statistics that I just talked to you about? Life begins to end when we become silent about things that really matter. This is one of my favorite quotes. I've tried to figure out who this guy is. I can't really, it's interesting. I can't really, you get these quotes in life sometimes, you know? And uh, you can't always, you know, sometimes you learn things about the people and you think, wow, now I don't like the quote as good. But listen to what this says. A true sinistral commotion is directly proportionate to how deeply the lie was believed. When a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to masses over generations, the truth seems utterly preposterous in the speaker of Raven Lunacek. Tick. Doesn't that sound like a chiropractic office most of the time? Here we are in there trying to tell people about subluxation and health and well-being, and we look like raving lunatics. Just like we fell off the cart, you know what I mean? Like, where'd this guy come from? But the reality is the lie has been told so long. The lie has been told so long that you'll second mortgage your house and you'll have dinners at fire halls to raise money to get people more drugs that aren't helping them. Continue to do the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is insanity. It doesn't make any sense, but that's what we keep doing in America. Now we're fighting over who should pay for it. See, we're not having a health care debate over how to make people healthier. We're having a health care debate over who should pay for it. The issue is if people weren't sick and subluxated, then we wouldn't need to have a health care debate in the first place. The most important thing to do before any journey of discovery is to choose what we want to discover. I think we can all agree that we all want to discover and experience health, happiness, and vitality. Is that true? I've never met a person that didn't want to be healthy, happy, and have a vital life feel like they're contributing to their economy, whether it's your home economy or your social economy or your network of people that you interact with. We all have a want to feel like we're plugged in and we're doing something good for the world. And that's the best part about working in a chiropractic office, right? You get to show up every day and know you're doing something to make the world a better place than it was when you, when you went to bed the night before. But can you think of anything in life that's more important than how physically, emotionally, and spiritually healthy we are? It, it, let's look at it this way. We all know things that we probably could have done in the last week that would have made us healthier, right? I mean, there's all things you said, you know what, I could have done this, this, and this, and it could have made me healthier, right? And we all know things that we probably could have avoided doing that would have made us less sick, right? I did this, this, and this, that uh, if I'd avoided doing that, it would have made me healthier. So why do we do that? The reason why we do it is because the amount it matters. See, when something really matters, you change, don't you? Let me give you an example. I have a donut, right? And I say, hey, who wants a donut? And everybody raises their hand. Then I put a little arsenic in the donut, and I said, who wants a donut? Nobody raises their hand, right? What's different? The amount that it matters, right? All of a sudden, this thing's life-threatening. It's going to kill you. The reality is, the donut is always like, already life-threatening. You know, it's the most cancer-causing food on the planet is a donut. But we chow them down every day, and then we stand up and say, we want cancer to go away. Can't somebody make a drug to fix cancer? I'm not here to give you a nutrition talk because I'm, I'm a chiropractor, not a nutritionist. My reality is I want you to kind of change your paradigm of how we think about things. What we do is have to change the amount that things matter in our mind. We ought to be able to do it. Look, if we could change the amount it matters to a patient on whether or not they got adjusted or not, would they just do it? If it just mattered more to them, right? If you could say to that mom that you're trying to get her to bring in her kids to get adjusted because he's sick and snot and you know, sucking down inhalers every day, and you could say, if it, if it mattered enough to her, would she bring the kid in? Well, why doesn't it matter enough to her? Because she truly doesn't understand what chiropractic is, what health is, and how it would benefit her child. That's our job, to bridge that gap, to make it matter to her. When health is absent, wisdom cannot reveal itself. Art cannot be manifest. Strength cannot ex be exerted. 
wealth is useless and reason is powerless. That was written 1200 or 300 years before Christ. This isn't a new concept. Health is important. So when it comes to discovering how to experience health, happiness, and vitality, there are two fundamentally important questions that we must address. Why do we get sick and how do we get and stay healthy? How does this, what does this have to do with chiropractic philosophy? It has to do with everything with chiropractic philosophy because this is the question that D.D. and B.J. Palmer asked themselves, right? Why are people getting sick? And how do we get and keep people well? I'm going to answer those questions for you today. Why people get sick and how we get people well. We have to understand some concepts before we move forward. We have to understand what is health, what is wellness, what is sickness, what is homeostasis. What is health? I'll give you a definition that I've memorized over the years. This is the definition from Dorland's Medical Dictionary. This is the definition that the World Health Organization uses. It says, health is a condition of optimum physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Listen, a state of optimum. What's optimum mean? Best, right? Physically, my body, my body, mentally, my mind, socially, literally how I interact with other people determines my level of health, right? It doesn't say a state of feeling optimally, does it? It says a state of optimum physical, mental, and social well-being. And what does it mean, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity? What does that mean? That means I can't stand up in front of you and say, hey, I just had a great exam and I don't have any diseases, therefore I'm healthy. You can't be healthy by default, right? Because I could maybe not have a detectable disease yet, However, I can still not be optimum physically, mentally, and socially. Let's look at another definition of health. You know, your body is made up of 75 trillion cells. If all 75 trillion cells were working in balance and harmony, would you call that health? It would be, right? Would it be possible for you to be sick if you had 75 trillion cells that were all working perfectly together? No, it would be impossible. If you had 75 trillion cells that were all in balance, working properly, you couldn't be sick. Because by definition, if you were sick, some of them aren't working in balance and harmony. So that's what health is. What's wellness? You know, if you study wellness, wellness really comes from the baby boomers generation, and it really comes primarily from the hippie movement, right? <laughs> These were a bunch of people that just said, I'm not just going to go from the flow. I believe that life is more than just living a pain-free existence. I want to experience as much as I can physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually from life. So wellness is a, is a way of life. The reason we have to define the word wellness now is because you can attach wellness to anything and sell more of it, right? Like if I created a company that sold Wellness Preparation H, I would sell more than if I just gave you Preparation H. Now, I don't know what a suppository has to do with your overall health and well-being, but the reality is if I attach wellness to it, you'll buy more of it, right? So we have to define what these words are. Wellness is a lifestyle of experience as much as you can physically, spiritually, mentally from life. So sickness, by definition, is not having all your cells functioning at 100% all the time, right? So if 75 trillion cells and 10,000 of those cells aren't working properly, then you're not healthy. Now, the health visual analog cell scale. Here's what I'm saying. If a 10 out of 10, if a 10 out of 10 is having 75 trillion cells all working together harmoniously in balance, and a 0 out of 10 is, z is, is no cells functioning normally or in balance, right? We're all somewhere in between there, right? Our job as healthcare practitioners is to move people closer to 10. Does that make sense? But do you realize you could alleviate someone's symptoms without moving them closer to 10? Could I alleviate someone's symptoms without making them move closer to 10? Right? So you have a migraine headache, I give you a drug. Does that drug make any cell function better than before I gave it to you? But could it alleviate your symptoms? Does it move you closer to 10? No. So that's what we've been doing to America, right? We've literally been making people feel better, but doing nothing to make any of their cells function any better, so they perceive themselves as being better, but literally they're getting sicker and sicker and sicker to the point where one out of two of them gets cancer. Make sense? So we're going to come back to this visual analog scale so you understand a little bit more. We're going to talk about a few more things. In order to fully understand the scientific truth about how to get and stay well, we first um, need to understand five important concepts. We're going to talk about holism or naturalism. You know, if you read the definition of chiropractic, I actually brought this book. This is called Stevenson's Text. Um, this is the Bible as far as chiropractic philosophy is concerned, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, maybe somebody disagrees with me, but this is literally what governs our profession. There's 33 prof principles in here that says these are the 33 principles that govern chiropractic. And if you read it, it says chiropractic is the science of things natural. But what does that mean? 
That can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. I mean, marijuana is natural, I guess. Um, you know? Um, so let's just say this. Let's say natural means genetically congruent. What's genetically congruent mean? It's congruent with the genetic makeup of a human being, right? That we know how to process it, we know how to handle it. So anything that's congruent genetically with the function of a human being, we'll call that natural. So the thing's genetically congruent. Next we're going to talk about stress. In order to understand subluxation, you truly have to understand the stress response of the body. What do you have to do with those statistics every day in your office? What does a chiropractic adjustment have anything to do with someone's blood sugar, blood pressure, attention, focus, breathing? You have to understand the stress response of the body to understand how those relate. Why do I want to do that? Because I want to send you home today with a greater depth of belief in chiropractic and the chiropractic adjustment than you showed up here with today. I have a saying that I beat into my own head and into my, into my staff, and it's all disappointment is a result of unmet expectation, right? I say this every day, all disappointment is a result of unmet expectation. If someone is disappointed, their expectations weren't met. So my expectations today, so that I'm not disappointed, are that I send you home with a deeper belief in chiropractic than you showed up here with. Why? Because if your depth of belief in chiropractic grows, you will naturally see more people. It'll just happen. You want to reach your bonuses in your office? You want more patients to lay down on the table? You want them to quit asking you silly questions and just get adjusted and say, you know, if we want them to follow their care plans? Well, when your depth of belief is enough that you carry around a level of certainty inside you, that when you say it to people, they just behave in a certain way, all of a sudden, doesn't that make your job easier? It does, right? So we need to raise our level of certainty. So I want to increase your understanding of subluxation and chiropractic. I want to teach you the difference between genetics and lifestyle. Let me tell you something that's very interesting. According to genetics, between one and a half and two and a half percent of all health problems are actually genetic. I want you to think about that for a second. According to genetics, actually one and a half to two and a half percent, depends on what you read, of all health problems are actually genetic. Why does that matter? Well, I have arthritis in my low back. It runs in my family. Right? Oh, the reason I'm this way is it runs in my family. I'm going to teach you, I'm going to show you research today to show you that this isn't my interpretation of genetics. This is actually the truth of the way it functions. But our genes haven't changed in 40,000 years. You know, maybe you don't believe we've been here for 40,000 years. Let's please not have that debate today. We'll argue that another day. But the reality is, according to science, our genes haven't changed in 40,000 years. So if someone's going to do a family history on you, unless they're going back about 60 generations, it's a waste of time. Because your genes haven't changed in 40,000 years. <laughs> Why is that interesting? You know, human beings are more genetically similar than apples. You can take a person from Africa and breed them with a person from Australia to work great. We're genetically very similar. You can't do that with certain types of apples. <laughs> what does that mean? There's never been a hunting and gathering society in the history of the world ever found to have heart disease, cancer, acne, asthma, attention deficit disorder, menopause, depression, anxiety, What's the difference between, genetically, what's the difference between a hunting and gathering person than you? Nothing. Not a single thing. Nothing. So if you are genetically exactly the same as them, and they don't have those problems, how could it possibly be your genes? I mean, unless you're telling me you have low back pains because your Levi genes are too tight. It doesn't run in your family. One and a half to two percent of all health problems are genetic. So if a hundred new patients come into your office, there's a chance that two and a half of them actually have a genetic condition. The rest don't. That's a little unsettling, isn't it? I'll take questions at the end. Thank you very much. It's a little unsettling, right? Why is it unsettling? Ultimately, it makes you responsible, doesn't it? 
ultimately makes you responsible for your own circumstances and your own health and your own life. It's not easy telling that to people, right? It creates a little confrontation in the doctor-patient relationship. It'd probably be a little easier to say, uh, it runs in your family, take this. A lot less confrontation, wouldn't there? Genetics and lifestyle. The aging process. Really, why do we die? Why do we get older? How does this have to do with chiropractic philosophy? That's what I'm supposed to be talking about, right? We believe in chiropractic that the human body has an innate intelligence, right? An inborn wisdom that maintains our existence and heals us when necessary. So if this body really does have this innate intelligence, if it really does have this wisdom inside of itself to maintain its health, to heal it when necessary, what's going on in America? Because it doesn't look like the human body has an innate intelligence and a wisdom inside of itself to make it function healthy and happily throughout a lifetime. Does it look that way when you walk around through the mall or go out to eat or look at your patient population that comes in every day? It doesn't look that way, does it? It is the truth. The chiropractic philosophy is right. And I'm going to explain to you why it's not expressing itself that way. Holism and naturalism. We are animated soil. There is nothing in us that didn't come from earth, right? We literally are animated earth. You say, well, this guy's really talking about philosophy. He's getting kind of deep on me. That's what I'm supposed to be here to talk to you about, is philosophy, right? But we're, we're animated earth. There's nothing in you that didn't come from earth. So when you're dead and you rot into the ground, which is going to happen, right? There's 100% certainty of that. You're going to go into the earth and become earth, and new people are going to be made out of the minerals and the things that come from the earth right now, right? Literally, we just live on a big ecosystem. It's just, the earth is just a big recycling depot, right? You say, well, what does that matter? I'm going to give you... Let me give you a couple more statistics, just because I think it's good for our brains to go through some of these things. But they just did a study. I got this in uh, March of 2009. So this isn't old. This is new. But here's what it says. We went to Chicago, Dallas, Phoenix, Philadelphia, and Orlando. All right? You've heard of those cities. You know where they're at. And we went in, and we got fish from there, because there's waterways around there. If you think about it, in Dallas, Chicago... Phoenix, Philadelphia, and Orlando. There's a lot of water around there. Listen to this. We caught fish near water waste treatment plants serving five major U.S. cities. All samples of fish had residues of pharmaceuticals in them, including medicines used to treat high cholesterol, allergies, high blood pressure, bipolar, depression, researchers report on Wednesday. Where are all the chemicals going? What do you do at a senior home every night with all the drugs that are left over? Where does it go? Into this big ecosystem, into this big environment that we're living in, right? So Lily, if we're animated Earth and all we've done is keep polluting Earth with more and more chemicals and drugs, and then we're making new people out of Earth, are these people going to be healthier or sicker? Kind of interesting, isn't it? Think of your body like a rainforest, right? We're made up of cells. A rainforest is made up of trees. If I went in and cut out all the trees in the rainforest, would that affect the insect populations? Would that affect the, the, grow, the animal populations that live there, right? Or what if I go into your body and, and wipe out about 20,000 cells? Does that affect the population of everything or the functions in your body? Here's a... Here's a Here's a concept that has been revolutionary to my mind, and I, I hope that will be the same for yours. I just spent about two years getting a diplomat as what's called a certified chiropractic wellness practitioner. I don't know what that does for me other than give me some more knowledge, but uh, this is a concept that I learned going through this program. Physiologically, as human beings, we are animals. Really. We are animals. We're no different than any other species. But in our mind, we don't look at ourselves the same way, right? Remember I told you that there's never been a hunting and gathering society found that has been known to have chronic diseases. What happens to animals when we put them in a zoo, when we put them in captivity? You know what happens? What's the biggest struggle at a zoo? How do we make this environment as what is possible? How do we make this environment as natural as possible? How do we make this environment as congruent as possible with what these animals would live like in the wild? Why? 
But when you take this gorilla and you put him in a zoo, what happens? Does he get stress and anxiety? Does he get high blood pressure? Does he get high cholesterol? Right? Do they get seizures? They get, what do they get? Our diseases. I'm going to show you some, some research. It's called, they're called diseases of civilization. But let's do it this way. If I fed a chimpanzee what you eat every day, would it get healthier or sicker? If I had a chimpanzee exercise or move around as much as we do every day, would it get skinnier or larger? Do we have an obesity problem with animals that we move into a zoo? We do, don't we? Did the genes of that animal change from when we took him from the wild and put him in the zoo? Did the genes of the animal, did his genetic makeup change? So why did the animal get larger? Why did he have anxiety? Why does he have high blood pressure? Like in the wild, he would have to get up and work for food, wouldn't he? He'd have to run around and do things and move his body and exercise. You know, in Stevenson's text, it says that the human body requires a certain amount of movement in order to be healthy. In Stevenson's text, it says the body requires a certain amount of proper nutrients in order to be healthy. That's chiropractic philosophy. It doesn't say that we should treat health problems with nutrition. It says that we should eat in a natural way, in a way congruent with our genes. Correct? But when I started thinking about myself as an animal, and I thought, wow, that's pretty amazing. Would my dog get, I don't have a dog, if I had a dog. If I gave that dog what I ate on a daily basis, would it get healthier or sicker? You know, my mom has a cat that's got diabetes now. She's got to give it shots every day. Must run in its family, huh? There's what runs in this cat's family. It lays around and does nothing all day long. It's never had to work for food a day in its life. <laughs> and the food that we gave it, was it like a wild mouse that was running around that it caught and ate? Or was it like some processed crap that we just, you know, the, all the parts of the chicken that we didn't want to feed to humans, but now we usually feed to humans, and we put it into some kind of a pellet and fed it to it? I mean, in a, in a wild, would a cat go out and eat corn? Well, what do you think? You, what do you think your cat food's full? You know, you take corns and grain. What any kind of filler we can? If you, well, my parents' cat doesn't have diabetes because it's genetic. It has diabetes because of the way we treat it. Because guess how we treat it? Like a human being. Well, how's that working out for us? You're a wild animal in captivity. Start thinking of yourself that way. Say, when was the last time I had to go work for food? Now listen, I don't want to become a hunting and gathering person. I like getting in my car and driving here today. I like being able to turn the lights on and I have electricity. I like being able to have heat in my house. I mean, I appreciate these things. You know, I, there is a stream near my house, so my wife could go there and wash the clothes. Um, you know, we, we could get things, you know, we, we could go back there, but I don't think that's, she don't think she would enjoy that. What's my point? If we're going to live in our industrialized culture, maybe we have to change some of the things we do on a regular basis to make our lifestyle more genetically congruent or natural. Does that make sense? That's chiropractic philosophy. Look, I'm here today because I want there to be less people sick and dying when I'm dead than when I arrived. Because I taught them about subluxation. Because I taught them about chiropractic. Because I talked about the natural laws of life. I want you to leave here today and maybe exercise a little more because of something I said. Maybe eat right a little bit more as much as I said. Maybe just lay down on a table and get adjusted every week like you're supposed to and not forget some weeks and make sure you get your adjustments and your spine's healthy and your nerve system's working properly. The plant analogy. If I walked into a room and there was a plant there and it was wilted, would you immediately ask me what drug or surgery that plant needs? That's kind of goofy, isn't it? You would say oh, it needs water, sunlight, or nutrients, wouldn't you? So why when I walk into a room and I have a wilted human being, is it natural for me to say, well, what drug or surgery does it need? It just doesn't make any sense, does it? We have to start looking at ourselves in a different way. That's what chiropractic does. It looks at life in a different way. We literally, our philosophy in chiropractic changes how we look at everything. So 
let me give you a little, s does anybody have an open water that they haven't, Andrea, is your water, you throw it to me or something, I need to drink. Um, Let me give you an example of something. I'm going to help you think through understanding research a little bit better today. Let's say I got a plant and it's wilted. And I'm going to do a randomized double blind trial on how to make this plant not wilted. Okay? It's randomized. What's that mean? We didn't hand pick our plants, right? Um, it's double blind. You know, we don't. That doesn't mean they poke both your eyes out. It means that the plant doesn't know what's happening to it, and, and, who's ever do, and whoever's administering the different techniques doesn't know what's going on with it, right? So we take this plant, and we say it's wilted. And Gary says to me, I think it needs water. So I give the plant water. So we're going to do a trowel. We're going to give one, water, one plant water. We're going to give one plant fake water, and we're going to see what happens. Interestingly enough, when we're done, both plants are still wilted. If the question is, does water make a plant stop wilting, what's the conclusion? No, because he gave it water and it didn't stop wilting, right? So according to that research study, giving waters to plant that's wilted doesn't help it. Now, do we all know that giving a wilted plant water is good? But in that study, it proves that, it's, that it doesn't, right? And you say, well, the problem is the plant's in the shade. It needs sunlight. So now we're going to take a plant, we're going to give it sunlight and water. We're going to give another plant fake water, real sunlight. We're going to give this one fake sunlight, real water. And we're going to give this one fake, fake, right? You're going to have to follow me on this one. You have to think with me for a little bit. At the conclusion of the study, the plant's still wilted. The question was, does giving the plant water and sunlight make the plant less wilted? At the end of the study, the plant's still wilted. So the conclusion is, the conclusion of the study is that giving a plant water and sunlight does not make a wilted plant not wilt. I'm going somewhere with this. Hang in there. So you say, well, the problem is you gave it water and you gave it sunlight, but it doesn't have any nutrients. Now, this one's really going to get tricky for me. You're just going to have to kind of follow the theory, right? So we're going to give this plant real water, real sunlight, real nutrients. We're going to give this one fake, fake, real, R fake, real, fake, Real, fake, 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 real, fake, 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 right? You got it? There's nine groups, all right? The conclusion of the study is the plant still willed it. So sunlight, water, and nutrients doesn't make a plant less wilted. And you're saying, Dr. Mills, that's stupid. I know that if you give a plant sunlight, nutrients, and water, it makes the plant healthier. But that wasn't the question. The question was, does giving a plant water, sunlight, and nutrients make it less wilted? See, the problem is that upstream, there's a guy and his boat motor is leaking gasoline, and it's getting into the soil of the plant, and it's making it wilted. My point to you is this. We have to be very careful with how we interpret, interpret studies, because it's all about the question we ask. We didn't ask, does giving water, sunlight, and nutrients to a plant make it healthier? That's not what we asked. What we asked was, does, does it make it less wilted? So I'm going to do something different. I'm going to come up with a green plastic that you can inject into the limbs of the plant. And I'm going to inject this green plastic into the limbs of the plant and make the plant's limbs not wilt and hang down, make them stand up, right? According to that study, does injecting green plastic into the limbs of the plant make the plant less wilted? Yes. My question to you is, did it make it healthier? Isn't that amazing to think through it like that? that was, maybe I'm a little slow learner, but it was pretty amazing for me to go through that example and think through that. Because that's exactly what our healthcare system does. And direct green plastic in there makes it less wilted. Here's your chiropractic philosophy. In chiropractic, we never ask, how do you make the plant less wilted? Who cares? We ask, how do you make the plant healthier? Because they just injected it with plastic. Did it make it move any closer to 10? But if we gave it water, sunlight, and nutrients, would it move closer to 10? Would more cells function normally in that plant? It may still look w wilted because a guy's got a boat motor that's leaking diesel fuel or gasoline into the soil and killing it. But did what we do make it healthier? Do you understand sometimes why you think you're not getting results in patients and you actually are? 
Betty says she still has headaches. Here's another point. Even though we were giving the plant everything it needed, it was getting toxins in it, wasn't it? The point is, sometimes in order to see results, you have to address every single component. It's not easy, right? I'm not saying we have to be everything to everybody. But let me tell you what you've got to do to be healthy. Here it is. Do you want to know how to stay healthy? You need to be pure and sufficient at the same time for a period of time to be healthy. You have to be pure. What does that mean? You can't dump toxins into it. It has to be sufficient. It has to get the nutrients it needs. And this has to happen at the same time for a period of time in order to get results. So sometimes we may teach patients things that make them more pure and more sufficient. But what are we going to do? Do that for what? A period of time. We've got to keep eliminating the factors. So they're getting adjusted, and their nerve system's working better, and their body's getting better, but they don't feel like they're not wilting. Their concern is with the wilt, right? Why? Because medicine has trained us that the only thing we're supposed to monitor is whether or not the plant's wilting, or in pain, I mean. Get it? We're trained that the only thing we're supposed to look at is whether or not the plant's wilting. We're not trained to look at what do we need to do to make the plant healthier. So we've got to give chiropractic time. We've got to teach people, to patients to be pure and sufficient, and we need to give it time to let their bodies heal. That's the sixth principle of chiropractic. Every process takes time. The Great Lakes. So in the 1970s, fish started floating up on shore in the Great Lakes. Some of you may remember this. I mean, like crazy, they were floating up on shore. Tumors growing in them. Uh, you know, malformations in development, um, sick with diseases, right? Would it be logical in your mind to see fish floating up on shores dead at the Great Lakes, right? The, you know the birds that were eating the dead fish that were coming up on shore? Literally, it was, they, their shell, it was making them sick, so their shells were so weak that they, even, they couldn't reproduce. They couldn't reproduce other birds, right? So not only was it killing the fish, but it was killing, remember the ecosystem, this whole thing we're part of? It was killing the food chain down the line, right? Would it seem logical at all for you to say, what drug or surgery do these fish need? What would seem logical is, how do, what happened to the fish's environment, right? What happened to the environment that the fish are living in that they're now getting so sick? Would it make any sense to start dumping drugs into the water and set up fish hospitals along the side, of the, the side of the shore so that all the fish that we could see that were sick would start giving them drugs and surgeries? It's silly, isn't it? Isn't that what we do in traditional health care in America? Aren't one in two bodies floating up on shore with things like cancer? Two in every five people have heart disease. Forty to sixty percent of all children are diabetic. We got at autism and asthma and ADHD rates that are booming off of the charts. And we keep saying, instead of saying, what did we do to the environment that these people were living in, we keep asking, what drug or surgery do they need? Do you see how important it is for you to educate your patients about the philosophy of chiropractic? Chronic stress. I'm going to teach this. This, this is my example to get you to teach you about subluxation in a different way. We, we typically all understand subluxation uh, on, a, on a relatively basic level of that there's, a, there's some sort of a biomechanical disturbance in the spine and that biomechanical disturbance causes degeneration of the spine prematurely and some sort of neurological damage or interference. I want to teach you a def, uh, uh, something about the stress response. What is the stress response? Some people call it fight or flight, right? You've heard of this. So the reality is if you, if, you know, if you were sitting at a pond having a drink of water and all of a sudden a tiger comes jumping out to chase you, certain physiological responses would immediately happen in your body, right? Let's talk about what happens. First thing that would happen is what? Actually, you would downregulate your insulin receptors. The reason for that is that you would want to increase the amount of blood sugar in your blood because you're going to need sugar in your blood because you're going to be running from a tiger. Does that make sense? You're going to increase your blood lipids, right? You're actually going to increase your LDL because LDL, which is, that's the bad cholesterol, right? There's no such thing as bad cholesterol. There's just appropriate cholesterol and appropriate cholesterol. Your body only makes appropriate cholesterol for, for what it needs, all right? So it raises the LDL because LDL is what makes your stress hormones, 
which you need to produce stress hormones because you've got a tiger chasing you, right? And it also helps in wound clotting or, or healing the wound, right? But you also need to increase your sticky factors in your blood, right? Because if you're getting chased by a tiger and you get bit, you're probably going to need to clot that off, right? But we're going to suppress our immune system. We're going to decrease. We're going to downregulate the function of our immune system, right? Because we really don't need an, a, our cell-mediated immune system when we're being chased by a tiger. Now, if we live through the experience, we're going to need to turn that on because we're going to need to maybe heal up some wounds. But during the process, we don't really need our immune system to be functioning. What we need to be doing is spending all of our energy getting away from there, right? It also, what it does is it it decreases our ability to focus in order to increase our sense of awareness, right? So we, we're getting chased by a tiger, right? We need to be really aware of that, right? Like, what's going on? Where is it at? Is it, you know? Do you ever see a stressed out individual? Are they kind of like that? And you're trying to have a conversation with them. And yeah, 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 I hear what you, yeah, 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 my cell phone's right here. Did you say something like that, right? I mean, they seem to have a little bit of a problem focusing, right? Well, that, that's because in a stress response, we need to increase our awareness it, and when we do increase our awareness, it decreases our ability to focus or to learn. I mean, if you're being chased by a tiger, do you really need to be able to read a book? You need to be able to learn. So it suppresses our learning centers, right? I want to go through these because I want to make sure all, we, I hit every point. Oh, yeah. We use up our serotonin, right? Serotonin is our mood stabilizer, right? So when we're under a stress response, we're trying to stabilize our mood. We're going to start using up all of our serotonin, which are our, our mood stabilizers. We're going to crave fats and sugars. Why are we going to crave fats and sugars? Because our stress hormones are made up of fats and sugars, and we're under a stress response. We're getting chased by a tiger, so we need lots of stress hormones, right? So we're going to crave fats and sugars. Do you ever feel like you crave fats and sugars? Probably none of you guys have ever felt that way, right? <laughs> we're going to increase our blood pressure, right? I mean, we need to increase our blood pressure so we can pump this blood all through our body so we can get away. We're going to increase our heart rate. We're going to increase our blood sugar and blood fats. We're actually going to decrease something called sex hormone binding globulin. Um, you don't really need a whole lot of sex hormones floating around in your blood system when you're trying to get away from a tiger. Now, maybe some men still would have a desire while being chased by a Bengal tiger to stop and have sex. I, I maybe had that urge myself, but, um, <laughs> but we really don't need sex hormones when we're getting chased by a tiger, right? But the problem is, is when, <laughs> when you decrease your sex hormone binding globulin, Actually, what happens is it doesn't bind the sex hormone and get rid of it, so you actually end up with, with more testosterone and things like that in the system. The problem with, with sex hormones is, is they're mitogenic. What does that mean? They cause rapid cell division. So I'm going to wrap all this together here for you a little bit. So we got increased, um, we, got, we, we, we downregulated the receptors for insulin, right? So we're trying to get blood sugar down in our body but the blood sugar receptors don't work right anymore, so we're producing tons of insulin, right, to try to lower our, our blood sugar levels. Insulin is also mitogenic, meaning it causes rapid cell division. So let's wrap this all up together. In America, we typically don't get chased by taggers much. Would you agree? But do we think we maybe live under levels of chronic long-term stress? Does that make sense? Okay. In hunting gathering societies, typically stressful situations were short lived, right? I mean, I do something to save my life and then that's over, right? That's not how we live now. We've changed our culture in a way that we really don't have life threatening things happening on a day to day, moment by moment basis. But we do live under this chronic level of stress, okay? Which causes a chronic stress response in the body. So, how did what I tell you, how did that sound toward having diabetes? In, in, increased level of blood sugars. How did it sound toward heart disease? Increased heart rate, increased LDL in the blood, right? How did it sound toward auto, um, autoimmune disorders? How did it sound toward, you know, what, what is cancer? Cancer is an immune system problem. So we've downregulated our immune system, right? Because we don't need our immune system. We're being chased by a tiger. So we've downregulated our immune system. However, we got lots of insulin and, and lots of sex hormones. So sex hormone binding globulin. So what's that mean? We have rapid cell division. So you got people with diabetes, they got really, really high insulin, but they got suppressed immune systems because they're under stress. So your immune system's not detecting the cancer cells, but you're causing rapid cell division with insulin. Does that sound good? See, what I, what, what I learned when I learned about the stress response is that the stress response in the body, you say, well, that doesn't sound very good. Why does my body do that? The stress re response of the body was innately created for you to get yourself out of that situation 
and then be done with it, right? It was to buy you time to get yourself out of the life-threatening situation. So, i.e., you're on an iceberg, right? So I put Larry on an iceberg. He's sitting on an iceberg, and his body starts to pull all the blood to his core, right, so that he can have blood for his organs and his brain. Now, is that intelligent? It's intelligent, right? Is it healthy? No, because it makes some cells, like his, his foot's going to rot off, right? So it's not necessarily healthy for the foot, you know, but it's intelligent. Here's my point. His body's doing that to keep him alive, to buy him time to get himself out of the stressful situation. It's buying him time to get himself off the iceberg. All right? Now, I'm sure I could invent a drug to give to him so that while he's on the iceberg, we, we keep blood going to his foot and keep his foot alive longer, right? Now, that would be good for his foot, but would that cause him to die sooner? My point is this. As long as he's sitting on the iceberg, does it really matter what we do to him? It doesn't really matter, does it? The object is to get him off the iceberg. That's the problem with America. Everybody's on the iceberg. And instead of teaching them how to get off the iceberg, we're giving them drugs so they can live on the iceberg better. <laughs> it temporarily makes them feel good, but they're dying sooner with all kinds of diseases because of the chronic stress response in their body. Here's the deal. What causes the stress response? Hans Selye, who's a Canadian researcher, who's probably the world's leading authority on stress, says this, that all stressors have the same effect on your body. It doesn't matter if you're being chased by a Bengal tiger or flipping a guy off in traffic. It causes the same response in your body. Anything that causes toxicity or deficiency in your body is a stressor and triggers the stress response. Anything that's toxic or deficient in your body. So if you're deficient nutrients in your body, it's going to trigger the stress response. If you're toxic in something in your body, it's going to trigger the stress response. Subluxation is a toxicity and a deficiency. It's a toxicity of bad information back to the brain, isn't it? It's an overload of nociceptive or bad information back to the brain. The joint's not moving right. That's a negative experience to the joint. It's sending negative nociceptive information back to the brain. So, it's a toxicity. But it's also a deficiency, because it's a lack of proprioceptive movement back to the brain. The joint's supposed to be moving and sending signals back to the brain, but because it's not moving, it's not. So there's a deficiency in proprioception or movement stimulation. There's a deficiency in movement, and there's a toxicity in nociceptive information. My point to you is that subluxation causes a stress response, which causes all those things we just talked about. So when you adjust someone and correct the subluxation, you turn down the stress response in the body, which decreases the risk of someone having what? Heart disease, diabetes, attention deficit disorder, autism, asthma. So when you're sitting there thinking, this doctor's telling me that if he adjusts this kid, he can improve the kid's focus, and you're thinking, how does that work? That's how it works. Because when the kid has a toxicity or deficiency, when he has a subluxation, it causes a decreased ability to learn and to focus and an increased sense of alertness because he's in a stress response and you have to correct the subluxation to remove that. Does that help things make sense to you a little bit better? That give you more of a scientific or a logical perspective on behind how what we're doing is helping these people? We have to reduce the stress response. Every time we adjust someone, we reduce the stress response, we increase serotonin levels. What are serotonin levels? Mood stabilizers, right? And help the person. Now, unfortunately, we can adjust the person. They can still do a whole bunch of other crap that causes the stress response, right? But the reality is you have to understand the bigness of the adjustment because it's big. What time do I go to, Larry? Another half hour. Half hour. So, toxicity and deficiency cause stress signals to stress cells. It stimulates the brain centers in the stress, increases stress hormone, causes emergency breakdown for short-term survival, which increases chronic illness, chronic pain, arthritis, osteoporosis, cancer, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, obesity, fatigue, anxiety, depression, thyroid problems, attention deficit disorders, emotional problems, cognitive problems, dementia, Alzheimer's. Do you think we have problems with these things in America? 
we have problems with these things in America. How do we treat all of them? By removing the toxicity or deficiency? Or by giving people drugs and surgeries? Do we move them closer to 10? Or do we help them stay on the iceberg and just live longer with the same problem? Genetics versus lifestyle. Achieving a chronic illness requires years of discipline. <laughs> Not a few bad meals, missed workouts, or negative thoughts. Chronic illness rates are rising exponentially worldwide. Obesity and diabetes are now pandemic in children. Let's think about that. It used to be called type two, or it used to be called adult onset diabetes, right? Is that what it's called? Adult onset diabetes. What's it called now? Type two diabetes. Why do we change the name? Because kids have it, so it's not adult onset. Evolution and creation both point to lifestyle as the cause of chronic illness. I'm going to get into some genetic information here with you because I think it's really important that you wrap your mind around that. If you filled the Empire State Building with books, if you filled the Empire State Building with books, I don't know how many books that would be, I don't know how many pages that would be, but it would be a lot. Could we agree it would be a lot? Human beings differ genetically by a couple pages. That's how genetically similar we are as human beings. We differ by a couple pages. I'm going to read you some studies, so bear with me. Our DNA, specifically the 25,000 genes identified in the Human Genome Project, is now widely regarded as the instruction book for human body. But genes themselves need instructions for what to do and where and when to do it. Where do these instructions come from? The environment. The internal and the external environment that the cell is in. Inside your body, outside your body. These instructions are found not in the letters of DNA itself, but on an array of chemical markers and switches known collectively as the epigenome that lie along the length of the double helix. So the gene is, so that my arm is the gene, right? It's the, the, all the genetic code. But on it are these switches that turn on and off to determine which genes are going to express themselves. Which genes are turned on and off, which ones are going to express themselves are determined by the environment that the cell is in. More and more researchers are finding that an extra bit of a vitamin, a brief exposure to a toxin, even an added dose of mothering can tweak the epigenome and therefore alter the software of the gene in ways that affect the individual's body and brain for life. They're not chiropractors, but a subluxation could be in there, right? The removal of a subluxation would do the same thing. The even greater surprise is the recent discoveries the epigenetic signals from the environment can be passed on from one generation to the next, sometimes several generations. You say, well, I thought things didn't run into family. For a few generations. So if I do something to my body that turns on certain switches, listen, my genes didn't change, right? The genes are exactly the same, but which switches are turned on and off changed, right? Now, I could pass that on to my children, but if they change the environment that they put the cells on, they could switch on to healthier genes. Does that make sense? The gene itself doesn't change. What's eye-opening is a growing body of evidence suggesting that the epigenetic changes brought on by one's diet, behavior, or surroundings can work their way into the germline and echo for future generations. What's that mean? If we raised a bunch of healthy chiropractic kids, that literally we could change generations of genetic expression. What in the heck was that? Collect your, collect your menu. Mice. Why is it? Why am I going to teach you about agouti mice? These are the mice that are used to study cancer, right? The reason they choose these mice to study cancer is because they have what's called the agouti gene, right? And this gene is the cancer gene, right? So they use these mice for years and years and years and years and years to study cancer because this is the cancer gene. Typically, when Agouti mice breed, most of their offspring are identical to their parents, just as yellow, fat as pud cushions, and susceptible to a short, uh, life-shortening diseases. The parent mice in Jertle and Waterlands experience, however, produced a majority of offspring that look completely different. So all of a sudden, for generations, they've had mouse, mice like this, and all of a sudden, they started producing mice that look like regular mice. They weren't these little fat mice that got cancer all the time, right? These young mice were slender and mousy brown. However, they did not display their parents' susceptibility to cancer and diabetes, and they lived to a spry old age. You say, what in the world happened? The effects of the Agouti gene had been virtually erased. Remarkably, the researchers affected the transformation without altering a single letter of the DNA. So they didn't have to go in and alter the DNA of the mouse. Their approach instead was, notice in quotes, because everything that's in quotes is from the study. Their approach was radically straightforward. They changed the mom's diet. 
That's all they did. I'm telling you, if, you know, anybody that studies cancer, ask them about these mice. They know about it. These mice were used for years and years and years. This threw a wrench in the entire plan of what was going on with these people and what was happening. This should not have happened. Look, if you're, if you're born with Down syndrome, does it matter what I feed you or how much you exercise? Are you always going to have Down syndrome? Now, you could be the healthiest Down syndrome kid in the world, right? We could adjust you and give you good nutrition, exercise, but regardless of what we do, you have Down syndrome, right? That's genetic. If it's genetic, if it's in the DNA, if there's a mutation in there, it doesn't matter what I feed you, it doesn't matter how many times I exercise you, it doesn't matter how many times I adjust you, it's genetic. It doesn't change. What they just found out is it wasn't genetic. And they said, oh, oh, what do we do now? Most important point was that they changed the mother's diet toward an innate diet. They had the mouse start eating typically what mouse eat instead of our man-made food that we were giving them. No cancer, no diabetes, no early death. What does that mean for us? It means the mice that we were studying to learn how our bodies function. Before, genes predetermined outcomes. Through the study of epigenetics, the notion that lasts proved outdated. Suddenly, for better or worse, we appear to have a measure of control over our genetic legacy. We now, now, everything we do, everything we eat or smoke can affect the genetic expression of the future generations. Epigenetics introduces the concept of free will into the idea of genetics. Some people that could be depressing. To some people that could be extremely empowering, right? To a chiropractor, it's extremely empowering. That means what I do to a person can literally change their genetic expression. Isn't that what BJ talked about? That a slip and a fall is a small thing. That subluxation is a small thing. But to that man, it's a big thing. Do that to a few people and you control a, a town. Do that to more people, you control a city. Do that to more people, you control a state. Do that to more people, you control a country. And he said that the subluxation was the largest concept he knows. This isn't some airy-fairy philosophy stuff that we're talking about that doesn't, there's no rubber to meet the road. Genetically, when we put an impulse into that spine and correct the subluxation, we're literally changing that person's life and possibly their children's life and their children's life. Epigenetics says that what we do to people literally can affect for three generations. So look, put, put Mountain Dew in his bottle if you want. Put Mountain Dew in his bottle and then complain to me that he can't focus in school, he can't sit still, he doesn't want to learn, he's got diabetes. And tell me it's genetic and it runs in his family, you had the same problem, you didn't want to sit still in school either. Give me a break. Do we really want to make people healthy or not? I mean, that's really what we got to decide. World Health Report, World Health Organization, Geneva, 1987. Affluent populations habitually consume a diet that was unknown to the human species a mere 10 generations ago. Well, if we're consuming a diet that was completely unknown to 10 generations ago, then when you're doing your family history next time, make sure he goes back at least 10 generations because now we're going to start to get some real data. Compared with the diet that fueled human evolution, the so-called affluent diet, that's our diet, diet of today, has twice the amount of fat, a much higher ratio of saturated to unsaturated fats, a third of the former daily fiber intake, much more sugar, sodium, fewer complex fruits and veg vegetables, carbohydrates, and a reduced intake of micronutrients. Worldwide, the adoption of this diet has accompanied by a major increase in coronary heart disease, stroke, various cancers, diabetes, and other chronic illnesses. Look, once again, this isn't a lecture about nutrition. It's a lecture about chiropractic. These are toxins, just like a subluxation is toxins, right? So you have to make that transformation in your mind when you're reading it. Current modern chronic diseases, including cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, cancer, are the leading killers in Western society and are increasing rapidly in developing countries. In fact, obesity, diabetes, and hypertension are now even commonplace in children. Overwhelming evidence from a variety of sources links most chronic diseases seen in the world today to physical activity and inappropriate diet and consumption. Anytime you see in a study decreased physic, in, uh, physical inactivity or decreased physical exercise, I want you to always translate that in a chiropractic mindset to subluxation. Because when you have subluxation in your spine and parts of your spine can't move, that's, an ex that's a deficiency in movement. That's a deficiency in proprioception to the brain, which causes the same response. It's called the movement pleasure pathway neurologically. 
And when you adjust someone, you stimulate the movement pleasure pathway, or if you jump up and down in a gym, you stimulate the movement pleasure pathway. And spinal structures go to the cerebellum, not extremity structures. So you got to move the spine to create the stimulation. Listen, this is one I want you to pay attention to. This is from the American Journal of Medicine, 1988. This isn't earth-shattering stuff. This isn't so new I can't, I can't, you can't understand it or nobody's had a chance to read it yet. From a genetic standpoint, look, from a genetic standpoint, human beings living today are stone age hunting and gatherers displaced through time to a world that differs from that which their genetic constitution was selected. Do you get that? From a genetic standpoint, you're no different. Unlike evolutionary maladaptation, our current discordance has little effect on reproduction. Why? It doesn't kill you fast enough. We still live long enough to be able to reproduce. Does that make sense? That's what they're saying right there. You're still going to be alive long enough to reproduce the species. For some people, that's unfortunate. Our current discordance has little effect on reproductive sex. Rather, it acts as a potent promoter of chronic illness, atherosclerosis, essential hypertension, many cancers, diabetes, and ob obesity. I want this to empower the chiropractors and the staff to understand that literally our patient's health isn't genetically predetermined. I grew up learning that I was sick because of bad germs, bad genes, or bad luck. That's what I was taught. That's bad science. But you know what? Even after I became a chiropractor, I never had the science to support that I believed that that wasn't true. I believed that that wasn't true, but I didn't have any science to tell me, Mike, that's different. Now I have the science that tells me, you know what? That's not true. That is a lie. And now we can have confidence and certainty. What do we talk about certainty and confidence when you're talking to patients? What does that do to follow through? Less missed appointments, right? There's increased evidence the resulting mismatch fosters, listen, diseases of civilization that together cause 75% of all deaths in Western nations. What if we got rid of 75% of all deaths? How would that change healthcare spending? Would it really matter who paid for it then? Most of it would just be gone. It would be non-existent. It wouldn't matter. Now, 75% of deaths in our society are caused by genetically incongruent lifestyles. Look, I want to go back to this one for a second. That guy looks like an Olympic athlete, doesn't he? Seriously. In today's world, that guy looks like an Olympic athlete. That's just Joe Schmo. Here's the thought. You have this thought. I think of this every so often. Maybe I'm a little weird, but work with me. And if they took us and they dropped us into a hunting and gathering society, <laughs> how much use would we be? <laughs> you know, I heard someone say this one time, and he was joking. He said, they'd probably kill you and eat you. And then he said, you know what? They're probably smarter than that. They wouldn't kill you and eat you because you're full of saturated fats and you're sick. They would, they would look for the, you know, he, you know, it's like the thing you're sitting on an airplane. You think, if this airplane goes down, who am I going to eat first? I pick the healthiest guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> I want the I'm eating the healthiest guy. That's, that's who I'm eating. But look at that guy. He looks like an Olympic athlete. That's the difference. That's how they age. There is now unequivocal evidence in the literature supporting that the notion of an environmental factors combined, including physical inactivity, amount for a major, the majority of chronic health issues. Indeed, environmental factors have been identified in 58 to 90 percent of causal factors of most chronic diseases. This is a study that I tried to get in. Um, I sent them letters, I sent them pictures, I sent them emails. I've always wanted to be in a Scandinavian twin study. How about you, Larry? Yeah. Huh? I'm like, gosh, I, you know, I've never wanted to be in a study, but this study I wanted to be in. Put me in the Scandinavian twin study. So they did a Scandinavian twin study that found that 58 to 100% of site-specific cancers had an environmental factor. Do you get the point? They're twins. They're genetically exactly similar. Genetically exactly similar. If genes predetermine your life, it doesn't matter what we do to each one of them. It's genetically predetermined. Get it? It disproves the whole theory. A total of 91% of the cases of type 2 diabetes and 82% of the coronary heart disease cases in 84,000 female nurses could be attributed to habits, so-called high-risk factors, diet low in fiber, un polyunsaturated fats, high in trans fats, sedentary lifestyle, smoking. The more you adjust from chronic health conditions in the United States are from environmental factors. I'm going to move along a little quicker here. I already hit all these. This is like a recap slide. You don't need that. 
I'm going to go through the aging process quickly. So you say, why do we die? If we're supposed to be so stinking healthy, why do we die? It, it's actually very simple. Staff maybe understand this better than doctors, but maybe doctors do too because they look at their forms too. When your cells replicate, they make a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. Right? So you're born with a cell. That cell divides and make new cells. They divide and make new cells and new cells and new cells and new cells, right? What happens to your forms when you make a copy of 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 a copy? Do they get blurrier and blurrier and blurrier and harder to read and harder to read? And harder? Every so often that happens, right? You look at a form and you're like, what happened to my forms? Why don't they look nice anymore? Because we weren't photocopying from the original. We were photocopying from a photocopy. Then we photocopied from a photocopy of a photocopy, right? You get the point. Your genes are the same way. They get so hard to read that eventually they can't read themselves and you die. It's called organ failure, disease, that, that's, that's the deal. Here's my point to you. Anything that increases cell division, does that make you die sooner? Right? So if we could slow down cell division, we actually would slow down aging. We can't stop aging because we're still making copies of copies of copies, but we could, right? What increases cell division rapidly? Insulin. That's why a low glycemic diet is of critical importance. I'm less concerned about your weight. I'm more concerned about you dying before you should. Because you're pumping sugar into your body, it's killing your immune system, it's causing rapid cell division, and you're making photocopies of photocopies of photocopies so fast that you're dying at 70, 80 years of age when he's hunting and gathering societies. You know, the Hunzas, um, the people in the Georgian Republic of Russia, there's people in Costa Rica. You know, in, in Hunzika, it's over near the Himalayan, Himalayan Mountains, you have to be 109 to be on a town council. 109. Now, we are killing these populations off. There's still a few we can study. The Inuits in Greenland and some Aborigines in Australia. Um, in Papua New Guinea, there's, some, there's uh, some hunting and gathering societies. But these people, they have no chronic disease. That, that's not even within our consciousness in, in America. So you're making photocopies of photocopies of photocopies. That's why you're aging. Increased cell division. Here's the pond analogy. Our subconscious mind works in metaphors. That's why I use so many metaphors. But here's, here's the way it goes. If you have two ponds, right? One pond you put fish in and uh, you manage it and you take care of it. And another one you dump beer in and french fries and soda pop and cheeseburgers and you don't ever take care of it and you never put any fish in it. You never you know, put any plants in it. Which one is going to fill up with sludge first, or first and be dead first? Which pond? Pretty simple, right? But it's an easy picture to get in your mind. Both ponds should live the same amount of age. We killed this one faster because of what we did, not because genetically that one was supposed to die like that. I want to get to the part in here where I just got to give you some facts. There's some facts. Chronic illness rates are rising rapidly. These are, why do I give you these? I'm not trying to be negative by giving you these stats. Here's what my mentor told me. My mentor in chiropractic was a guy by the name of Joe Felicia, which a lot of you guys here know who he is, but he always told me, he, he had, he had, I don't know if you ever heard him talk. You say, Michael, the bigger the problem, the greater your solution. The bigger the problem, the greater your solution. The greater the problem, the more empowered you should feel because you are the solution to this problem. Where are you going to refer someone to to learn this? Other than the chiropractors in this room. There's no one, Right? Over 46% of the U.S. population currently has a chronic illness. This accounts for 78% of all health care spending. 78% of all health care spending. 76% of Americans take prescription drugs. There are 33.5 prescriptions per year, per person, per year in the U.S. Think about that. Americans now consume 25 million pills per hour. What's my point? We already have access to health care. We already have access to health care, and chronic diseases are going. Phew. It's not because people can't get health care. Give me a break. It's because they get too much of the wrong kind. Heart disease, 501 million. Cancer, 430 million. Digestive disorders, 337 million. Obesity, 320 million. Diabetes, 273 million. Arthritis, 118 million. Osteoporosis, fractures only. Remember I told you that, 38 million. 
per day. Per day. Do you know that we're going to bankrupt our economy? If these numbers continue to increase at the rate they're currently increasing, we don't have a big enough economy to pay for it. And we can't get motivated to wake up and help patients every day. <laughs> we can't come up with the energy to stay focused, to educate patients about bringing in their family and their children for chiropractic care. We're embarrassed to work in a chiropractic office. Look, we're the solution to this problem. We're not causing this problem. We're the only profession, we're the only doctor, we're the only doctor that has the solution. We're the only licensed doctor out of traditional health care. The cost of sickness is increasing. 2002, spending was $3.5 billion per day. This figure is to over $7 billion per day by 2013. while our human genes haven't changed since 8,000 BC. So empowering. Do we get sick because of bad germs, <coughs> bad genes, or bad luck, or due to bad choices? I do a program called Eat Well, Move Well, Think Well. That's why that was there. Look, I thank God every day that medicine's here to save my life when necessary. Right? On my way home today, if I wreck my car and rip my leg off, there's a good chance I'm going to live through that because I live in America. But that's not what we spend 78% of our health care dollars on. 78% of our healthcare dollars are spent on chronic illnesses from people that need the chiropractic message about health and life. The problem created by a lack of proper exercise, movement, or spinal motion and alignment. What drug could fix a problem created by toxic physical stresses from sedentary living, sitting all day, improper posture, spinal motion alignment? What drug could ever fix a problem created by a lack of required nutrients and whole foods? What drug could fix a problem from poisons and pesticides and herbicides and hormones and other foods? You know, I'll tell you when we actually, if you study when human beings really, really got sick, we really, really got sick after World War II. It's called the chemical revolution. We went from fertilizing our fields with manure to fertilizing our fields with petroleum-based fertilizers. We went from, where did your pesticides that you spray on your food come from? chemical warfare in World War II that's been tweaked to adapt to spray it on your food so that you have something to eat and feed to your kids. What drugs could ever fix a problem created by a lack of required love, forgiveness of self and others? What drug could ever fix a problem created by toxic level of hatred, anger, resentment toward yourself and others? What is the solution? How do we avoid the illness and suffering? It's simple. We need chiropractic care. We need to eat well. We need to move well. We need to think well. I can end here. There's more slides. I don't know where my time's at. Um, we'll wrap it up right here. I'm going to give you something to read, and then we'll move on. This is a quote that I use to motivate myself quite often. I truly believe that our biggest fears are about how big we could get. Right? Like, it's scary thinking I'm the solution to that problem for some people. It's scary thinking that you're standing there at a step, you think, what training do I have? What authority do I have to give people health advice? Listen, just after this lecture, you know more about health than 99.9% .9 of the population. Share what you know with them. You're experts in chiropractic, and chiropractic is the solution to this problem. Nelson Bandela read this at his inaugural speech. It says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small doesn't serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it's in everyone. 
And as we let our light shine, we consciously give others permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our fears, our presence automatically liberates others. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your seminar.